What's the distinction between real and nominal income? Well, in other words, what we're talking about is a situation like this. We have these two commodities. You spend all your income on them, which means if you use all your income to buy X, I know it is your nominal income. It means it's your money income. Okay? So your nominal income, if you use all of it to buy X, what determines how many units of X you'll buy is the price of X. So indeed, it depends on which country you are, what the currency is, and what the prices are. Equally, if you want to spend all your money on Y, it depends on the price of Y. What would happen to your nominal income if I doubled your income, your money income, and I doubled all the prices? I would say practical income would remain the same. What is practical income? So practically, what I can do with that amount of money. I said you, I double your nominal income and I double all the prices. What will happen to your income, I, your nominal income? I actually said it. It will be twice as much. If I double your, in, your nominal income, it means that your income will be twice as much. Right? But I also double all the prices. So has your income really doubled? Well, yes, his, your nominal income did double. If it's 150, now it's 300, it is twice as much. Your nominal income did double. But what didn't change? Your real income. That's the difference. So that it creates a problem. How do we measure real income? And that's where we have to impose some discipline. What we say, well, let's agree on a definition. And here we have the two alternative definitions. The Hexian definition says that we are the measure of our real income is our utility. And that means that as long as we have the same level of utility, we have the same level of real income. And the alternative measure, the Slutsky measure, says, well, as long as we can consume the same bundle that we consumed before, then we are at the same level of real income. Um, on that same uh, model, can I just confirm that with Hicksian with the Hicksian change, you essentially roll around the indifference curve, but with Slutsky, you pivot on A until they parallel. Is that correct? It is correct, but I'd rather you didn't think about it in these terms, because you are reducing the analysis into geometry, and geometry is just a tool. Because if I talked about it in more than two dimensions, all these pivoting and, and the sliding would mean nothing. So we have to really understand what these concepts are. But you're right to say that the that a, all the Hicksian substitutions simply look at what you look at, you look at the, there's a certain indifference curve, and you ask what will be the quantity demanded at all possible prices. So that will give you a Hicksian demand function, which we don't do at this course. But if you keep this thing, you ask what will be the quantity demand of X at any possible price, which is, as you say, pivoting around, not all pivoting, sort of going around the, uh, uh, the, the difference curve, that uh, will give you the Higgs uh, uh, demand function. But if there's something, I mean, sometimes I have questions like this. Um, here's a question, past example question. If, uh, if the government always compensates for income effects, would the demand function ever be upward sloping? in a world of two goods. Yes? Why? Uh, I think it's because of the available resources. And, you know, every time, if the government compensating for it, I mean, people would soon need more, so... Okay. The problem with your approach what you're doing is saying you're trying to think of it in terms of your own experience, in terms of your own intuition. Forget it. Intuition, out. I'll show you it diagrammatically, but then I'll tell you how you should have thought about it intuitively once you use the diagram, once you understand the diagrams. So we start with this initial position. The individual is at point A. Right? This, I understand, is crystal clear. Now, so let's look at the case the price of X fell. So, we're going to move to this point here. The blue budget line is the new budget constraint. Is this clear? 
Now, let's look at the, ask the question, how much money would this individual now need if he were to consume at the same level of utility as he had before? So we simply take this line, we shift it parallel until it is tangent to this point, because this, therefore, is the minimal level. Is this clear? Right? And that difference is the money measure of the income effect. Okay? Now, we know that in a normal situation, the move from C from this point to the blue line, as it is a parallel shift of income, is the same as an increase in nominal income. So that's where the consideration of X being inferior and normal come into play. Right? Are you with me? And of course, what will bring about an upward sloping demand is if the end, individual end up being pulled here. Right? So that will be a demand, an re increasing demand because as we move from Px0 to Px1, the quantity of x is falling from x0 to so point A to point Vg. So we have an upward sloping demand, right? This is the normal situation. Now what happens when the government compensates for the income effect? In this case, it means that the individual experiences an increase of real income at the differences between I0 and I hat. What does it mean the government compensates? The government takes it away. Exactly as when he suffers a loss, the government pays him. So the government, the government takes away the money equivalent of the increase in income. So where will he end up being? He will be on C. Will be on C. Right? That means he, if you compensate for income, you end up on the same utility function. So can the fall in the price of X lead to a decrease in consumption of X? At C, remember, even though it's a given good, the substitution effect is still the same, the stim inverse. So that means that when the price fell, the substitution of X, the substitution effect, say, buy more of X. This was XC. It was simply the income effect that pushed us back from here to here. And therefore, because the Hicksian substitution effect is always along this line, it is always inversely related. When the price of X goes down, you'll want to buy more of it. Now, what's the intuitive explanation you should have offered, but based on the diagram? Again, not based on your experience, but based on the, on, on the material. Well, an, an, an answer without a diagram should have gone as follows. What defines a normal or inferior good is the response to changes in real income, right? A normal good is a good that the consumption of it increases when real income increases, and an inferior good is a commodity the consumption of which decreases when income increases. But when you compensate for the income effect, there is no change in real income. And if there is no change in real income, there's no question of being normal and fair good. The consideration of normal and fair goods do not come into operation because you have muted them by removing the income effect. That's an intuitive answer, intuitively, to this question, which doesn't require the use of the... So if you answer this, by the way, just in two-liners, saying, no, because real income, because the measure of inferior normal good is a real income, and as you remove it, there will be no effect, the substitution effect is always inversely related, that will be perfectly okay.